Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good. That's very good. The next five days, it's going to be like that, folks. We're going to have a great itinerary because it's really bing, bing, bing. They hit you with everything from French to Dutch to British, Leeward, Winwood. It really gives you quite a smorgasbord of islands, and the itinerary is really super. But you have to be ready for it. You've been practicing the last couple of days how to eat on the ship, how to get around on the ship. Well, now you're going to get off the ship, and you're going to see some of the jewels of the Caribbean. You're going to experience some of the things that we've enjoyed for the last four decades. Please, um, some of you asked me questions about dive spots. Um, after working a dive service out of St. Croix for years, way back in the 60s for the Carnival Line, I tell you that there's wonderful dive locations on every island. The best source is the shore excursions people to find out where the dives are going to. I was just looking at the shore excursions form and trying to pick out some to recommend. I, my favorite's Rainbow Reef in St. Croix, but uh, I don't see any connection to Rainbow Reef on here. When you book your tours, you ask them more specifically about the dive locations. The one thing about shore excursions is time. For years, I told the students, when I took them on tours to different countries in Europe or Latin America, the only thing you can't replace is the time. Time is exceptionally tight. Even though it looks like we're there for eight, nine hours, when you do a tour, you're going maybe three to four hours. And depending what time you get off, <laughs> what time you wake up, she doesn't wake up early, so I get up late. But we're going to do, you know, a tour in, in St. Lucia. We're going to do a tour in St. Kitts. We want to do the train ride in St. Kitts. But when you pick these tours, you need to know that there's time constraints. The cruise line has backed up these tours. So they're safe, they're time considerate, and they really give you some of the best highlights. So I was looking up some things for people, and um, I went by and picked up the shore excursion form and looked at a couple of them. I want you to compare some of the highlights, tours, to see if they go to the same location. Normally, they go to two locations each tour where they give you a stopping point. And sometimes it's for shopping. And don't remember, guys, tomorrow's a day to hide, hide all your plastic. Anything that you have that resembles plastic, ca cabin keys, credit cards, hide them all tomorrow. They have a special process where they use up your plastic in St. Thomas. I've spent more money on jewelry in St. Thomas for her than everywhere else in the world together. This one stop is amazing. And you go from store to store to store. They've all got the same things. You can find different prices and bargains. We'll see how many ships are in port. That's the key for tomorrow. If there's two or three, we're in good shape. If there's seven or eight, don't do this, because they're not going to get your arms up too easy. But the next five days, the reason you're on the ship, the next five days, little patience and tolerance. You go ahead and you time yourself. Make sure you watch the ship's time. Your watch has changed now, right? Because I met one couple, bless their soul, they hadn't changed their ship's watch, and they mixed yesterday's talk by an hour. And I said, I've done that, and I'm the one that's supposed to be talking. That actually happened on one ship going to Panama Canal three, four weeks ago. And they changed the time in the middle of the day. At nighttime, it's one thing. But when they do it in the middle of the day, and the captain comes on at 12 noon and says, good morning. No, it's good afternoon now. It's 1 o'clock, not 12 o'clock. And you, I just sit in there eating my breakfast, and all of a sudden I realize 2 o'clock I'm supposed to be in the theater, and I've got to run. So please, next five days, watch your time. The time is very important. You're going to have a great itinerary. Today, a story about the world's second oldest profession. 
second oldest profession. Now, you guys already know what the first oldest profession is, so I ain't going to tell you that. But the second oldest profession was amazing. Do you realize the waters we are now entering, and we haven't hit the turn yet past the Mona Passage, we're off Hispaniola, we're heading towards St. Thomas. This area had 8,000 different pirate ships. The pirates, people say, well, they built the islands up for all the different nationalities. If you had a letter of marquee or a letter of reprisal, you kept your flag flying, not the black flag I'm going to show you. You kept your flag flying, and you went and you set up different settlements and colonies. You raided ships. You raided towns. The uh, so-called beginning, it was an early time, 1522, the first pirate to hit Hernando Cortez's silver ships coming out of Mexico was a Frenchman by the name of Jean Ango, A-N-G-O. The date, 1522, he nailed four of the silver ships. Now, please, silver to the Spanish. At first, they sent these bars. They called them pigs of the iron. They were not iron. They were silver. They weren't polished. So some of the pirates did stupid things. One pirate, Bartholomew Roberts, he nailed one Spanish ship that had over 100,000 of these bars of silver, big galleon. He took one bar to melt down into musket balls. He left the rest. The Spanish died laughing as he sailed away. His one bar was worth 75 pounds sterling. <laughs> it was solid silver. They called it Nombre de Dios, the silver trail across Panama. Every pirate from Sir Francis Drake to Henry Morgan all hit it at different times. But when you spell pirate, no back then, they spelled it P-Y-R-A-T-E-S. The pirates were really a most unusual breed. The first ones in this hemisphere that set up were the French, an island that we're going by just about now, called Tortuga. It's off the northern coast of Hispaniola, or you call it Haiti today. That was where the French set up their first raiding camps. Now, I use the word camps because they didn't build the forts and stuff you're going to see on these different islands coming up. That would come 150 years later. The first pirates that stayed in this hemisphere were the French. They said, we object to the Treaty of Tordesillas. You know, in 1494, they divided the world with a demarcation line. Everything to the east was Portuguese. Everything to the west was Spanish. Well, the Spanish, for 106 years, were not challenged. They had an empire. I told you about it a little bit yesterday. Oh, anyone that wasn't here yesterday, raise your hand. Was the food good? No. Hey, I'm glad you're here. The pirates, though, 189 years of the golden age of piracy. If you saw two ships passing right where we're at now, you fired on them. If they turn and ran, you chased them. If you caught them, you might find that they had three rather large mines that the Spanish would work with the Arawaks that I told you about yesterday. This particular highway is called the Road to Nombre de Dios. All across their folklore, they talked about Sans Luis Potosi in Upper Peru. You call it Bolivia today. They brought this silver, normally $11 million a year, for 264 consecutive years. Only three times did the pirates get all the silver away from them. They would bring it to the west coast of Panama, take it across the isthmus of Panama, to Cologne. And some of you that have been on the Panama Canal trips, you told me about Cologne. And I just spent the last five weeks doing the Cologne cruises. But uh, the, the work of these Spaniards loaded these galleons. Spanish galleons were terrible ships. I don't care what kind of food they had. They were four-fifths above the water line. Ten percent of them would turn turtle within sight of land. But the Spaniards like to have these huge floating forts. The English ships were one-third the size, and they would cut them off and try to shoot away their rudders, 
and then the, uh, this would happen with the Spanish Armada. They did that. But the Spanish had these ships, and if you can see down, uh, if you can see down in the hole, they actually formed the first yellow brick road, only it wasn't gold, it was silver. So it was a silver brick road. These pigs of silver were used for ballast down the bottom of the ship. Sometimes that didn't work either. Now this particular route, every year he would come from the 1550s to 1595. His name was Sir Francis Drake. Yes, he got in bed with Elizabeth and got knighted and got called Sir, but he was one of the most prolific raiders of his time. He hit every Spanish city, 31 Spanish cities. He got everything from St. Augustine to Manila, but he never came alone. He always brought, this is the smallest amount, that's 23 ships going across the ocean, going back. Sometimes he has many as 35 ships. He would come as the sea dog, and he would hit the Spanish where they were least expecting it, the cities and towns. When you see each of the uh, islands we're going to the next five days, you'll see forts at the entrance of every island. Every one of the bays you go into will be fortified. They'll have gun batteries and, in most cases, fortifications. Didn't stop Drake. Drake would be smart enough to get off the ship away from the port and take it by land. Drake was amazing. He didn't look bad, ladies. That's Sir Francis Drake. Eh. His ship was the Golden Hind, H-I-N-D. Notice the gun ports. The Spanish galleons didn't have that. Now, this is the island we're passing right now. And this was the first pirate haven, Tortuga, right here. Last week, I was sailed to right here, Labrador. But this is Tortuga, and this is where the most infamous of all the brutal pirates lived, because they stayed there too long. They were called Bucaneers. Now, notice the garments they wear. They don't have... Peter Blood's swashbuckling attitude or appearance. They wore mostly hides. They didn't have that pirate look. They were bucaneers, bucan. They stole Spanish cattle. They smoked it. They stole and hunted pigs. They smoked it. Iguanas, rats, and possums all wound up. And they did take them to the ships and tried to sell them. Now, the thing about the Bucaneers were these rifles. Guys, they didn't have weapons with rifling in the barrel. So the long, the length of the barrel really helped them in their marksmanship. They could knock an eyeball out of a squirrel 50 feet away in a tree. I don't believe that, but that's what's in the books. I would find that an incredible shot without having rifling in the barrel. The Bucaneers got very brutal, 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 what's that word from? I didn't have breakfast yet, no. His name was Ladonius, O-R-D-A-N-I-S. Of all the French Buccaneers, he was the sickest one. Here he's got a prisoner tied up to a tree, and he's ripping the guy's heart out, and he's making one of the fellow prisoners eat the heart of the person. No, they didn't walk the plank. They didn't go do the stuff you see in the cartoons and all. They didn't do that stuff. It was an amazing life. The boredom made them sick in the head. It also made them <laughs> kind of homosexual. They ran around looking for Indians, or they did dormitory handball. They really were strange until the governor of that island were passing. She got that. That was 37 seconds later, but someone got that. The, the bit with the French, this guy, Ladonius, and the rest of them were savage animals that hunted in packs. So the governor of the island went to Paris, and he bagged, literally, 300 French prostitutes, brought the first white women over to the island of Tortuga. Bingo! Oh, that's the wrong word that comes up next in here. <laughs> he wiped out the seriousness. They were sick, but
But once they got the women here, it settled down Ladonius and the other French pirates. His name was Bregnon. He was the first governor. He brought the prostitutes in. 300 prostitutes really turned piracy down a little bit. Now, the sloops that they sailed in. Here's a Spanish galleon. Notice the high part of the quarter deck. There's four swivel guns up there. And usually there was two uh, seamen, one master's mate, and one officer, four people on the deck. They would have, and you can't see them all there, but they're hidden underneath the sail. They would have at least 10 rifles. And as soon as these guys would poke their heads over a bit, if there was only four, if there was only four, they would take shots at them. And if they could get them all, they would climb up on the quarter deck and take over the ship. Now, this happened a lot of times. These buccaneers were able to take the ships, and they did forget about atrocities. They trapped the crews underneath, locked them in, and then burned the ship. They used small boats.